O God, make speed to save us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Let's pray together the psalm responsively by the half verse. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then was our mouth filled with laughter. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for us. Restore our fortunes, O Lord. Those who sowed with tears, those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Our reading is from the Gospel of Mark. When they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, Jesus asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Thanks be to God. Today we are celebrating Harriet Star Cannon, and this is what the church tells us about her. Harriet Star Cannon founded the community of St. Mary, the first religious order for women formally recognized in the Episcopal Church. Cannon was born in Charleston, South Carolina in 1823 and was orphaned in 1824 when her parents died of yellow fever. She grew up with her only surviving sibling in Bridgeport, Connecticut, in the home of relatives. In 1851, Cannon entered the Sisters of the Holy Communion, an order founded by William Augustus Muhlenberg, rector of the Church of the Holy Communion in New York City. The sisters were heavily involved in the operation of clinics and care facilities that would become St. Luke's Hospital in the city of New York. During her years with the Sisters of the Holy Communion, Cannon served as a nurse. Over time, Harriet Cannon yearned for a more traditional monastic form of religious life. When agreement could not be reached with the Sisters of the Holy Communion, Cannon and a small group of her sisters moved to form a new order on the Feast of the Presentation, February 2nd, 1865, Horatio Potter, Bishop of the Diocese of New York, received from Harriet Cannon and her sisters the traditional vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience at St. Michael's Church in Manhattan. The sisters began life together as the community of St. Mary, and Harriet Cannon became the order's first superior. The postulate of the community of St. Mary began with nursing and the care of women who had endured difficult circumstances. After time, however, Mother Cannon and her sisters became increasingly committed to providing free schools for the education of young women in addition to their medical work. The community continued to grow and developed schools for girls, hospitals, 
and orphanages in New York, Tennessee, and Wisconsin. Mother Cannon died April 5, 1896, at Peekskill, New York. The community of St. Mary played a critical role in response to the yellow fever epidemic in Memphis in the 1870s. Sister Constance and her companions are remembered on September 9th. There's a reason we aren't perfect. People never are. So it doesn't surprise us when the disciples, the people who knew Jesus better than anyone ever, ever mess up, just like you and me. And yet it still can be jarring. Sometimes we get fatalistic and go to the extreme. If they're no better than what, then what chance do I have? But usually it goes the other way. We just don't think about it. I mean, that was so 2,000 years ago. The disciples were the disciples. It doesn't matter how close to perfect they were. They rolled with Jesus. They are certified, official. They've got the ID card to prove it. Right? And that idea that the disciples are somehow distant from us or greater than us, or better by virtue of being a disciple, that's less than helpful. The thing about this reading that I love is that it says so much so quickly while being in the middle of my favorite part of Mark. Jesus predicted his death, and Peter tries to stop him from heading toward it, and Jesus calls him Satan. Right? And then he takes that Satan up a mountain with two brothers to have a transcendent experience. People don't mess up as bad as Peter does and then turn around and get invited to the spiritual pinnacle. That's not how we see the world. And while they're up the mountain, the disciples suddenly can't heal anybody and they're freaking out. Kind of like the people freaked out when Moses went up the mountain. Only... Nobody's making a golden idol this time, and Jesus heals the boy. The disciples ask why they weren't able to exorcise the demon, and Jesus responds cryptically, This kind can come out only through prayer. I can't really tell if that is shade or just truth. Then Jesus predicts his death a second time, and rather than have Peter get all protector bear on him, the disciples ignore it. They're preoccupied with competing with one another. Greatness. It has an MJGA vibe to it. Who among them will make Judah great again? Jesus, on the other hand, says greatness comes from service not from boasting or conquering. But he doesn't really have to say anything. They were silent because they know better. And then, ever the visual storyteller, Jesus finds a child and holds her in the middle of them all. Welcome her, you welcome me. And you welcome God. It's hard not to think of the way we welcome immigrants and children and victims of violence of all sorts and conditions today. Especially when the operating voices treat them like guinea pigs and hope they don't die. Or almost worse, survive their parents as an infant. Harriet Cannon's story isn't confined to the tragedy of the death of most of her family, or that she and her only surviving siblings would be raised by people who were not her parents. It would be too easy to speak to the turn of the orphaned girl toward the cloistered life for there is something almost mythical in our culture about the role of women religious. 
or the certainty of the livelihood of young women in the 19th century necessitating such decisions. But that's not what drew her to it. In fact, it went the other way. She started with service and the need to give back. And from that, she discovered a call to the monastic life. A pull that many find after they explore their yearning for God in the world. It seems this paints a more robust picture of discipleship than we like to think. This is what Jesus always communicates about devotion after all, that it comes through service and sacrifice. Canon isn't the victim of a pandemic, but the seeker of love and support for the people affected by all the tragedies of this life. She made her life into an act of service so that she could welcome God in the form of all the children she met. Because it doesn't take perfect, it takes a willing spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. In the season of resurrection, we are invited to find the renewed presence of Christ in our surroundings. Therefore, let us pray. Open our eyes. We hope to see. We know that we are the church, O God. Your presence is not restricted to a building but is present with us in our homes. Help us to see the ways your Holy Church is continuing throughout the world, even as we struggle to remember it. Open our eyes, we hope to see. We know that we are mortals, O oh God. You know our hearts, our love and our hatred, our divisions and our borders. Help this, our common family, by territory. These are leaders through election and all our common needs. Help us see beyond our walls and provincial thoughts to recognize your presence in every place. Open our eyes. We know that all of this is your creation, O God, and yet we take your blessing and grace for granted. Help us to love one another and all that is in your heart as if it were our own desire. Open our eyes. We know the joy of community, O God. You give us compassion and order, the very means of connection and capacity for building a common life. Bring our awareness to your vision of community that transcends boundaries and any sense of isolation. Open our eyes. We know we are weak, O oh God. You know the injustice we tolerate or endure 
the anger we exercise or receive, the forces of evil that encourage poverty and violence. We remember the imprisoned, the immigrant, and the isolated, remembering especially those who are choked by the coronavirus, those who treat them or pray for them, and all those suffering the anxiety this virus brings into our lives. Be with all who suffer. Open our eyes. We trust you, O oh God. You revealed your truest self in Jesus and invited us to see in him the breadth of life and the agony of death without allowing that to be the story you hoped to tell. We trust in you, and so entrust our dead to you. As Jesus invited Mary and Martha at the grave of Lazarus, saying, Unbind him and let him go, may we also unbind our dead and let them go. Open our eyes. Blessed are you, God of life, who raised his son from the dead into new life. Receive the prayers we offer this day and grant that we may see your holiness in the world around us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord.